So welcome back to SuperCloud 4, our fourth episode focusing on this topic of generative AI, the focus of today's live in-studio event. We couldn't have this next guest in studio with us today, so we're bringing him in remote. Vince Kellen, the CIO of UC San Diego, University of California. Vince, thanks for coming on theCUBE here for our generative AI SuperCloud fourth episode. Great to be here. Really appreciate it. I uh, want to get into the practitioner side of it. You're, in, you're out there, you're seeing a lot of things. CIO, you, you know about data, how data is structured. Generative AI is, the, is all the hype, all the rage. The reality is quickly matching up to the hype and use cases and how people are thinking about their IT environment, how they're organizing their data. We're seeing data warehouses being disrupted with data in the cloud. You're starting to see things like Parquet and Iceberg, open formats, changing how data is going to be managed. You're starting to see data models that are starting to match with cloud scale, um, this next generation, which kind of points us into this generative AI, which just dropped onto the scene and mainstream over the past year. What's your perspective? Because you know, whether you look at a learning system or an educational system or an enterprise, the game is still the same. You got content, you got to put stuff out there and engage with the customers. How do you see the Gen AI rolling out right now? Because you've written some great papers on this and essays uh, about knowledge graphs and about horizontal and vertical learning, right in line with Gen AI. What's your, what's your take of what's going on in Gen AI today? Yeah, I think uh, the thing that guides my thinking is Gen AI makes knowledge generally more available to people. And it actually levels up the more novice learner, the learner who's newer and brings them up faster. That's really the big impact for generative AI. So I just kind of follow that, that thread across any dimension of a business or in case, our case universities and students. Uh, so it's a big deal, no question. Some of the early research out of the occupational side is showing that it's a very big deal in terms of improving both quality and throughput of answers to questions and support scenarios. Uh, it's certainly having an impact on, as you saw in Hollywood and talking to some folks I know that are in the script writing business, uh, obviously they're starting to use generative AI to help in all of that process. So it, it makes knowledge generally available. People follow that thought anywhere you go. I want to get your thoughts. You, I know you've seen many waves of innovation from a technical perspective as well as business mm -hmm. uh, and certainly education now and, and, and many years ago. When the web came on, we saw a similar dynamic. You had the internet, was a transit, you had packets moving around all over the place. The World Wide Web comes out and then you get websites, okay? And that was a transition where everyone was disrupted. Oh, the web, should we put stuff on there or not? Is it browsable? We put transactions. We know what happened next. It all became adopted and happened. Education's online, businesses went online, everybody went online, the online population grew. Similar thing now with AI, you have AI apps coming and there's an infrastructure element too. So you had infrastructure, the web and the internet, yep. you know, moving packets around that enabled the web and websites, which is the application. Here with AI, you have the same thing. This is changing the game on how users are going to get content and uh, expectations are changing. Everything's changed with AI. This is happening now, the silicon's there, the cloud scale is there, the data architectures are there. Do you see a similar path where the entire world will move to be AI enabled at some level at an application, whether it's an AI wrapper app or uh, it's called AI wrapper with ChatGPT kind of wrapped into it or a cloud, um, cloud AI native app or something new. What's your take on this? I believe that many maybe even most of what we know as our user interfaces today are going to change to more of a conversational style, natural language style of interfaces. So the metaphor I use is, you know, Iron Man asking Jarvis a question. So it's causing us to lean into what we call conversational analytics rather than fire up a, you know, a business uh, intelligence tool and start to finger click away. You say, hey, what, what were my sales last quarter? Or what were my student counts this last term? and suddenly you get your answer back. Absolutely, this is going to appear everywhere. And anybody who's making money as a software developer on their software interfaces is extremely concerned about and leaning into that conversational AI enabled interface. That said, costs have to come down further. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll see, I mean, the market's the market. If it doesn't, <laughs> someone will do it. So, so I want to get your thoughts on, go, let's go to the next level now. Okay, so web made things faster than the old analog world went digital. Things are going to be faster with AI. Say the costs do come down. We live in a capitalistic society. That's sure going to happen with Amazon or with the competitors. Let's just say that it does go that next level. What happens next? Things are going to get faster. 
information is going to be faster, the interface is conversational, voice, and maybe machine to machine, everything's going on there. What's the future of our world? And, and I want to ask you this because you wrote a great essay on your newsletter on LinkedIn, the future of education, that kind of teases out what the future might look like in a knowledge-based right. world, where as things get faster, antiquated and outdated becomes an issue, even in state-of-the-art systems. It's going to be a constant game yeah. of chasing that next real-time value proposition. Absolutely, and so everybody's going to be rushing to adjust. I think all roads lead to what I call vertical AI, meaning I'm using the content and knowledge inside my organization and I'm making that available to more of my employees and more of my customers in a very efficient way, a way that I haven't been as efficient in the past. And so that's going to lead to what I call walled gardens of data and, and trying to protect the privacy of that data, both from an in, uh, IP standpoint and corporate strategy standpoint. Uh, this is going to stand in stark contrast to some of the big players like OpenAI, Google, and Microsoft that really need access to lots of content across the web. Enterprises aren't going to be so willing to share that. And they're going to tap open to start opening up smaller models to unleash, unleash that knowledge inside their organization. So it's going to be a really wild next few years. It's going to be interesting. You mentioned walled gardens, my favorite word, because if you go back 20 years, walled gardens were the antithesis of the open web. The web was about openness. And now you're starting to see walled gardens nope. being the intellectual property of companies, yet the large language models are called proprietary. So, yep. so instant flip script here. So what's your take on that? How do you rationalize that? And is that a good thing? And will this all interface with each other with data? So what's your, what's your angle on this? Well, on one hand, it's a bad thing, um, but on the other hand, it's a very good thing for companies who want to compete on their knowledge and information. So if you want to compete on your knowledge and information, you got a lot of tools, lots of ways to do it. Uh, so I think it's going to create the need to now selectively share that knowledge and information with partners and collaborators. So this machine to machine AI or collaborative AI, as I call it, is going to grow. The ability to take your vertical AI and match it up with, with horizontal AI. We'll take ChatGPT as an example of horizontal AI. You take ChatGPT, you fine tune it, or you use what we call prompt tuning to offset or augment it with your local content. Now you're starting to marry horizontal and vertical AI pieces. I think that's going to grow, become, there might even be a brokering mechanism down the road. New information providers uh, who can broker AI to AI to communications are going to be working. We're going to have multi-agent AI systems. It's not going to be the prompt engineering of today. It's going to be the orchestration of many AI modules, probably across multiple co company boundaries. Uh, so great new opportunity for a whole lot of new firms, still undetermined what that's going to look like. You so yes. Tease this out in your paper. I want to unpack that horizontal and vertical concept there, because <clears throat> what you're saying is there's a horizontal layer, call that the mainstream, and then you get mm -hmm. the vertical in the domain expertise or metadata, if it's, if it's data, how do you explain this horizontal and vertical knowledge base architecture? Well, well let's, let's look at the combustion engine from the turn of the century hitting agriculture. That's horizontal general purpose technology that everybody uses. You really can't alter it. You know, you can buy a different size combustion engine and you can do different things with it, but you can't alter it. Here, you can take the uh, AI tools and turn it loose on your content and now it's altered to you. So that's a vertical sort of approach. It, it, you're creating a new thing, essentially, that's part and parcel of your organization's information and knowledge. And so that's the horizontal and vertical. Vertical, would be, horizontal would be like the combustion engine. Vertical would be the combustion engine completely redone just for you per per perfectly. That's awesome. I got to ask you, I, and again, back to your future of education uh, th um, piece. Uh, future of education, horizontal and vertical AI and knowledge flow. I want to ask you something, and um, uh, I know you're in education, but I'll, I'll bring it up anyway, because I, I threw a haymaker on one of our podcasts with Dave Vellante, and I made a conjecture, and again, this is me on the podcast, so you know, take it with a yeah. good salt, because um, we pontificate a lot. I said to Dave, I said, um, and if you believe that the knowledge graph is in the future is here, going to be the future, LMSs, learning management systems, of the old, very linear, very old school, slower, could be outdated. And I said the following statement, we are potentially on an educational crisis of the equivalent of the mortgage crisis, where we're so over levered with education investment, but yet the content 
is not adequate and yet could collapse. Now, again, education yeah. will collapse, but the thesis is if we can't get an architecture for content matching the needs of the student, and you kind of tease, don't say this in the paper, but you're kind of teasing out that getting content at the right time is an imperative for educational institutions yes. because there's a lot of money at risk and you know the capital markets right now from what I've been reporting is tight with education. There's a lot of need for potentially bailouts or leverage um, debts out there. So there's a lot of pressure in education. What's your reaction to that? Well, first of all, I'm going to put some things out here that are counter to that. Uh, the value of the education is tremendous in terms of lifelong uh, earnings of the student who gets the degree. And that's now back to historic levels of highs from the 1920s. Uh, World War II witnessed a great leveling of access to education. We've reversed that over time. So whether you like education or not, the reality is you're going to get a million or two million dollars of excess earnings with a college degree than you won't. So that's going to create tremendous demand no matter what happens with price points. The um, other piece of education, while the learning management system is, can certainly be impacted, long ago we haven't, it's already been altered a little bit. The learning management system is now a place to hook different modules that interoperate with each other. In fact, I'm on the board of one at tech. That's what we specialize in, trying to get modules of interoperability embedded in an LMS. That's going to continue. I think where you're going to see some really interesting stuff is in the books, the textbooks. Textbook manufacturers are going to make those generative AI things. And so they're going to be placed in many different places. You might see instructors adding to that in a certain way. I think we're in an evolution away from the industrial age technique of having the large lecture class to now having generative AI deliver more of that content and now have instructors work on motivation, connection, and meaning the things that humans can do that generative AI cannot do. Uh, and so I'm hoping that that would be part of our future trajectory here in education. Yeah, great, great analysis. Thank you for sharing that. Great, great call out there. Let's go to that next level since you brought that up. One of the topics around AI is, does it replace the humans? You kind of mentioned it early at the top. People aren't afraid of it. They shouldn't be. The motivation you mentioned about that, it brings up this next role of what to do with the free time you have. If you're learning and or doing things with AI, that might have been mundane, toil, heavy, un undifferentiated, heavy lifting, as they say in the tech business. If AI can be a, an augmentation to the human, not just a chatbot, but like co-pilot-like augmentation, mm -hmm. yes. that implies value. So if that value is probably some of the boring toil or work that you can grind on with AI rather than the classroom, it frees up people's time. And so that's going to create some creativity and open opportunities. How do you see that happening rolling out in terms of how we deal with that. What fills the vacuum there? What fills that void? Well, I, for companies and educational, everybody, uh, starting at the top working down, you have to decide where to allocate resources from and to. So anytime you can allocate resources away from mundane, boring stuff, and you can allocate it to more interesting, uh, what are called value generating work, that can make a lot of people happy including many of the staff. Now there's a certain collection of staff and you, may, you can perhaps count me as part of, part of that where we kind of like that boring mundane work and we don't like it to go away. Yeah. But the creative destruction forces in the economy are going to weed that out quickly over time. Uh, yes, there'll be some job displacement, uh, but I think you're going to see much more of an augmentation effect, probably two thirds to three quarters augmentation effect rather than a replacement effect uh, to almost any job you can shake a stick at. Uh, the message we give is, you know, you're, you're not going to be replaced by AI, but you may be replaced by somebody who can use AI. <laughs> be an AI operator. It's interesting. It's the stakeholders remain the same. You know, people still going to need to be educated. They're still going to need to find a job. They're going to still need mentoring and peer review or other services that you get to get out in the workforce. All those things are going to probably be augmented by AI. So that's kind of the key. Uh, call yeah. out there, but, uh, and and that's going to be something that has to be a mind sh mind shift. So. How do the institutions yes. do that? <laughs> well, uh, I, you know, learning is learning is not a dry thing. It interacts with the human emotion and desire, the learner's desire. So institutions and educators really got to tap into the motivation. When you can double the motivation of a learner, you're going to quadruple their learning. 
the generative AI can help with a little bit of that motivation, but not all of it. And so institutions are going to have to now figure out how to enrich their, their pedagogy and their teaching so that they can use the generative AI, but then they can start to move some attention and effort yeah. to that deeply human element of learning. I want to get your thoughts quickly on the democratization angle and every of these big waves, yes. see this democratization, access is one, democratization. And and talk about the what needs to happen from a technology perspective, because this is not your yesterday's IT architecture. Mm -hmm. it's, a, yes. it's an AI system that's emerging. You're pushing buttons, you're turning knobs, you got personalization is a big part of AI. How do you see this being teed up or thought through from a holistic systems perspective? Well, the access component is kind of interesting because this is a class of technology that's kind of new for us really uh, in the technology world that it helps the less skilled knowledge worker more so than the highly skilled. It's really interesting. That's not been true for other, almost any other form of technology that we've had so far. The other side of that though is it's be, it's a ration to good right now, as you know, because of the pricing of the GPUs and chips that are out there and the services. Uh, so price has got to come down to get the democratization out there for institutions. We got to make sure we make this free and affordable to institutions. I think any student who's got some money in their pocket are going to be buying and subscribing to AI services to help them in education. My thoughts go to the student who doesn't have the money in the pocket. I'm a former Pell Grant recipient and I was scraping by in, in my undergraduate curriculum. Um, so I'm very sensitive to that and how to, how to get that democratized. So I think institutions can certainly help a lot in that regard with their AI strategy and make sure they can address what I call the social mobility equity side of it. But as a larger public policy issue, it's going to be a problem. I got to ask you about the motivation. I love how you brought that in. It keeps coming back, whether it's democratization from a motivation standpoint, getting that aspiration or a transition, an organizational. So as a leader in an organization, I'm going to be thinking about, okay, I want to make sure I don't foreclose the future, but I don't want to overdrive the past with hype. I got to deliver the right sequence of operations here. How should I be thinking about if I'm an executive out there, how should I be thinking about how to get people enthusiastic and confident so that motivation's in place. Yeah. How do you drive the motivation? Can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, one, one thing is um, we've had more requests inside our organization for us to go out and explain uh, this new technology. And it's from a point of desire and good. Said no one ever about an enterprise <laughs> system change, like an ERP system or a manufacturing system change. Nobody calls you up and says, tell me all the wonderful things about that. <laughs> but this is the one where it is. So now the, the, the first step is you got to tap into that motivation in the staff uh, that's really interested and curious. You then have to allow the period of ideation to occur where the organization can start to understand how this really works, where the benefits may be, then you're going to start to develop a whole bunch of use cases and then you start to prioritize use cases and the use cases you want on board are the ones that are going to give you the most confidence and feedback right away easier to do maybe smaller impact but shorter time frame and then start to build some successes uh, and then start to work at bigger and bigger applications i would not go for the most difficult uh, value impactful thing right away i would spend time to make sure you get your feet wet Vince, I want to get your thoughts as we wind down here on a, a trend that we've been talking about a lot in theCUBE. You know, in every cycle is always a, you know, some thinking, design mm -hmm. thinking, think like a designer, um, you know, iterate, um, data first, cloud first. There's a big focus right now, we've been talking about this idea of systems thinking, um, where there's consequences, not just isolating, building an app, thinking about the collateral damage of change and how to adapt. What's your view on systems thinking? Because you see a lot of people in this AI market, it's not just the young kids, it's you know the, the veterans who have systems architecture backgrounds. You're starting to see the young yeah. guns come up as well. So you have a kind of a diverse set of actors in this innovation curve. Yeah. Talk about this idea of systems thinking. Do you see it out there? And if so, what yeah. mindset uh, should people think about to be a systems thinker? Well, first off, I'm going to give you my full feedback on what you said earlier. I compare the IT industry to the fashion industry. <laughs> Every year, a new fashion comes in. Everybody goes, wow. The difference between us and the fashion industry, the fashion industry knows it's just fashion. <laughs> in IT, we think it's real. Yeah. However, I will say, yes, systems thinking or network thinking or complex systems thinking is absolutely in order. And First of all, generative AI is kind of that. It's a bit of a complex system in terms of how it works under the hood. 
And the probabilistic you know, sort of framework you got to throw over your operations of AI now is very different. Is it, like I said, this is not your father's data center anymore. This is a whole new thing. And so, yes, you need um, broader, holistic system thinking and complex system thinking and probabilistic system thinking skills on the business layer and the technical layer inside your organization. Vince, great to have you on. Final question, as you look at your journey, you see, again, seen many ways of innovation um, and you've seen what's in front of us technically in the business. What do you hope to see happen? What's the, what's the path in your mind's eye that you hope to see a preferred future with, uh, with generative AI? Well, I'm hoping it will certainly bring more knowledge to more people uh, and make us all better, not just some of us. So the democratization aspects I'm very interested in. Um, I think the disinformation and, and deep fake problem is going to be hitting us. Uh, and so I'm a little worried about that as well. But in terms of the long-term future, uh, certainly this is going to help keep the United States are very competitive uh, in terms of our business and industry, and certainly in, in the global uh, markets. Uh, the emerging markets that don't have an information economy, they're going to may, maybe miss this one out, which is a bit of a concern. So the gap between the haves and have-nots globally is probably going to expand a bit. So uh, like in all things in technology, there is always good, but there's always some of the bad stuff too. You got to let things rain. As Andy Grove would said, let chaos reign, then reign in the chaos. You got to keep in guard yeah. on it, keep yeah. keeps it on a leash, so much, so to speak. Um, Vince, great to have you on and appreciate your commentary and, and coming on and participating and contributing to our community on the SuperCloud 4th uh, episode here about Generative AI. Thank you. Thank you, John, this has been great. Awesome. Vince Kellen, CIO of University of California in San Diego. He's on the front lines of education. He understands the system mindset, the complex system, and the opportunity that Gen AI brings. We have to be mindful of it, understand the value and implement it. It's an opportunity for everybody, lowers the barriers to entry in terms of value and knowledge, and also le levels everyone out. This is going to be an opportunity we have to watch, and we're going to keep on watching it here in theCUBE. We'll be right back with more SuperCloud 4 after this short break. Mm -hmm.